Hey, welcome to Tuesday at the Huddle. I'm happy to be back with you. Yesterday we kicked off another miracle of Jesus in John chapter 6. But before we jump into our study this morning, I just want to say um, a, a happy dating anniversary uh, to, my, to my wife. Um, it was about uh, t 30 years ago um, that, uh, that we, uh, 29, 29 years ago, uh, that uh, we went out on our first date uh, January 24th. It's just uh, incredible how time has flown. Um, but yep, that was one of the best decisions of my life to go out with that pretty blonde um, at Cincinnati Bible College. And uh, um, boy, she's been a blessing to my life. Enough gush. Um, let's get into our lesson this morning. Um, and uh, yesterday we kicked it off again in John chapter 6. Jesus um, is followed by these crowds. They have a need to eat and they don't have... Um, the material resources to do it. They don't have the money uh, to really feed people. And this little boy has this small lunch, um, but that's not enough in and of itself. Materially, they're, they're short on resources, but of course, Jesus has a plan. John told us that Jesus knew what he would do. And he asked the question about feeding the crowds to test um, his people. So let's talk about the crowd that has gathered here a little bit. So we've, you know, a lot of Jesus' ministry we've talked about is centered around the Sea of Galilee, especially kind of um, the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is small, and so it's not difficult for people to follow by shore and catch up when Jesus would cross by boat. Um, and so the place where Jesus goes to the other side of the lake, he's trying to get away, but the people catch up to Jesus around Bethsaida. According to Luke, they catch up with him um, around Bethsaida. They catch up with him in this region, which had about 14 cities, um, each with about 15,000 people. And so Jesus right now is sort of at the peak of his popularity, and people by the thousands are coming to him, and some with idle curiosity, some with physical and spiritual needs, some with cynical unbelief, um, there are many reasons that brought these crowds to Jesus on that day. It's interesting that three verbs in John chapter 2 indicate that there is a continuous action of the crowds flocking to be with Jesus. Literally, this John 6, 2 reads like this. A great crowd of people was following him because they were seeing him, seeing the miraculous signs which he was doing for the sick. Each of those are continuous actions. So crowds are gathering because they're seeing the miracles that he is that Jesus is doing for the sick. So Jesus is walking around, he's performing miracles, and more crowds are gathering. And John specifically mentions that the time of the year is, is, is Passover. He says that in verse 4. And because there would be so many more people traveling at this time on the roads than, than during normal times, and they're heading up to Jerusalem because the Passover feast is near, just this great multitude just forms itself around Jesus. According to Matthew 14's account of this event, many were following Jesus on foot from all the towns. Jews traveled along the road that passed from the east side of the Jordan River so as to avoid traveling through Samaria. Remember, Samaria was, um, they, they called them dogs, they would call them half-breeds. People did not want to travel through Samaria. Matter of fact, if they traveled through Samaria, once they got out of Samaria, they would take off their sandals and beat their sandals so that they didn't carry that, that polluted dust with them into, um, into, out of Samaria and into Judah, Judea. Um, Bethsaida is located on the river uh, at a crossing um, near the mouth of the Sea of Galilee, where there would be a lot of boats there to ferry uh, people around the towns, um, on, especially on big feast days. Um, it was a supplementary source of income for the fishermen that on these big days when a lot of people were traveling, uh, people of wealth and people of poverty, of course, it was a little bit of extra income to kind of ferry people and make the journey easier. Um, Jesus saw the Lord's crowd. And Mark 6.34 tells us that he had compassion on them because why? They were with, like sheep without a shepherd. Now they had their religious leaders, right? But Jesus would call them vipers. He would often call them wolves. Um, and so Jesus has compassion. Even though they were going uh, to the temple, they were going to be with their religious leaders who should have been their shepherds. Jesus sees these people as sheep without a shepherd because their shepherds had gone so far astray that following them would lead to more danger rather than safety and security. 
you know, Jesus could have been irritated by the wrong motives of the majority of the crowd for interrupting his time alone with his disciples, but his heart, his compassion, you know, and, and, and when it says that he was moved, the understanding is he was moved in the depths of him. They, this phrase would not be his heart moved, but it would rather be his bowels moved, meaning that he had in the very depths of him this compassion for them. He knew their need, even though they did not understand it. And so the, the balance between rest and ministry, um, Jesus chooses the need in this case. Um, he wasn't going to neglect his responsibility because he didn't have the time or he didn't have the energy or he just couldn't give him any more of himself. He sees the need, he's moved with compassion, and he acts in their behalf. So at the end of the long day of teaching, there becomes awareness of this impossible situation. There, it's a remote place. They're not close to anything, and it's getting late to, to crisis, right? We're not where we can buy anything, and it's getting late and too dark to travel because it's precarious roads and precarious situations with bandits and other things that would also follow these large crowds. So the disciples come up with the plan of just send the crowds away, let them fend for themselves. Now let's put that in with James chapter 2, where if... James tells us that if we see a person in need and, and we're not moved with the same compassion with him and we simply say, go, keep warm and well fed, what good is that, right? In that context of faith without works is dead. So the disciples, their act is, okay, go and let people fend for themselves and Jesus will not have any of that. The gospel indicate that those listening and observing Jesus numbered 5,000 men and add to that the countless number of women and children. And it's not hard to imagine why the disciples were concerned. And so their solution is, let them go and fend for themselves. And I just want to pause there as we close today, that often that becomes my attitude and it may be sometimes your attitude when we see a need and the need seems overwhelming. Right? Rather than falling upon our knees and asking God to help us meet the need, to give us the resources, to give us the strength, oftentimes we're bottom line people. We do this in churches all the time, right? There's a need. God has given us the opportunity. What do we do? How much is this going to cost? So often we lack the faith to trust in the resources of God to meet a need, even though we see it as an impossibility. Nothing is impossible with God. And so I want to put Philippians 4.13 in that context, that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When we see a great need and we feel overwhelmed by the need, by the crowds or, or the need itself, let us never just resolve to let them solve it themselves or to let somebody else do it. If God has made us aware of the need, then God has given us the ability to meet that need. So let us fall upon our knees and let us by faith trust the one and only one who can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Let us trust him to give us the resources and the power to meet that need. And then let's go and let's allow God to work a miracle through our lives to the benefit of people who are like sheep without a shepherd. Let us not be those bottom line people who say, well, can't be done. Let us trust in faith and let us walk by faith as we work on mission for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this challenge. There are crowds around us who are starving. Oh, they've got plenty of food. We can always go and get a value meal from Wendy's or McDonald's. There are many resources to fill the stomach, but Jesus spiritually they're starving. And we have your word. We have the resources. Jesus, we have Jesus who is the food from heaven, the bread from heaven, and, 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 and the wellspring of life. We have everything they need. Lord, just let us be moved with your compassion for these sheep without a shepherd. And let us lead them to the great shepherd, the great physician, the healer of our souls, to Jesus, and who we pray. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow. Ready?